So this is the earlier incarnation of the series. If I run my hand over that, there's some waviness. A little bit of that Land Rover waviness. It actually came out of the factory in Perfect. Every Land Rover panel is slightly different. Well, welcome to a new Dave's Workshop Tours video, and today I'm at Series Magic in Melbourne's north. I don't think there's any doubt in what their specialism is. They've even turned on the weather for us just to make it feel that little bit more like home. So let's go inside and see what they're up to. Okay, Marcel, thanks for having us uh, along today. Tell us a little bit about the business here. Well, Series Magic, I'd still call it a startup. We've been going in this uh, lovely workshop for about a year and a half, but I'm not a mechanic by trade. I just got fascinated by Land Rovers. I actually inherited a lovely long wheelbase Series 3, and I sort of fell in love with this heirloom, and of course I had to start tinkering with it. So my involvement in it grew, and from there it just a passion developed. Um, and Dave, who, who now works here as my lead mechanic, um, I met him quite by chance and he started coming over on weekends and public holidays and helping me out, teaching me how to do gearbox strip downs and, and rebuilding. Uh, I did my first engine under his guidance. Um, and then I decided to leave landscaping, which is what I've been doing, and uh, start up the workshop. And now here we are. It's, we're an odd mix of people. We're, we're, there's only one qualified professional here. The rest of us are basically hobbyist enthusiasts, but we come from different walks of life, not necessarily Land Rovers. So Seth, who does the gearboxes, was uh, working on cellos. And so he has that, that finesse, that attention to detail. My brother Felix was working in something very high tech involving robotics and so on. Wanted a change from the sort of typical corporate kind of job and I persuaded him to come over and come and uh, tinker with Land Rovers. Dave spent 22 years well, in the it. army working on, largely really on Land Rovers so he does come from a professional mechanic background and he brings a lot of skills and knowledge that we otherwise wouldn't have. There's Dane who works here part time who does specialists in the early series engines. Um, he's a, a hobbyist enthusiast. Um, so we yeah, there's an eclectic mix of people and Series Magic is a little bit different, a little bit off the beaten track. We're all a little bit crazy in a good way, I'd hope. Um, You'd have to be to work on Land Rovers, would you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, because they're frustrating things. Um, and a lot of people who have them, they reach the point where they get stuck with something. They've tried to bleed the brakes ten times and they still can't get it to work. Or they decide a gearbox is beyond them. And, or you know, maybe an engine rebuild, that, that's, that's a little bit complicated and so that's where we come in. We're here to help the hobbyist enthusiast. Even some people are driving them as dailies, yeah. but, but most aren't. They're, for most people they're a recreational vehicle. Sure. Um, but if you go out into country Victoria you'll find people with work utes yeah. that are still out there hauling firewood yeah. and rounding up, rounding up cattle and, and yeah. so there is that mix of there's the there's the sort of the old Land Rover enthusiast and there's the new breed. The new breed lives in the inner suburbs they tend to work in office jobs, they tend to be pretty cashed up, but they tend to have little mechanical knowledge, especially dealing with classic cars. And so we, we cater to everybody. Okay, Marcel, so what have we got in? Okay, so in today we have, this is a lovely little Land Rover Series 3 short wheelbase. And as most of the Australian ones came out in this uh, Camino Gold colour, people sometimes call it baby poop, other people love it, like myself. They came in both the short wheelbase and the long wheelbase models. This one's a diesel. They came as both diesel and petrol. And this one's having an engine overhaul. And it also had a gearbox overhaul. And we're doing a few other things. We're putting a little bit of soundproofing there in the engine bay because Land Rovers are notoriously noisy, especially the diesel variant. Oh, There's wow. a, a lovely, reassuring agricultural clatter and uh, if you want to have a, a conversation as you're driving along, it's nice to have a bit of soundproofing sure. in there. Sure, that's soundproofing. Let's come on some ways. This very thin, what you're able to uh, put in there nowadays, yeah? It's, Compared to... it's thin, but it's pretty effective. Yeah, yeah. So in the old days, some, oh. somebody might just get a bit of, uh, bit of carpet or something. Oh. But, but this stuff's pretty good. Oh. And you can see there the gearbox down there. Makes it much more livable, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, a little bit more civilised. It makes a big difference putting it in the, in the roof as well. If you really want to deaden down the sound in your Land Rover, that aluminium roof uh, just vibrates at a resonant frequency when you're going down the highway. Uh -huh. So you want to put some lining on that roof. We haven't done that here, but... Uh, well, this one, no need for 
you know, aesthetic uh, restoration. This looks fantastic. Doesn't yeah, it, it does. It's got a lot of charm. And at Series Magic, we're not so keen on the spray the body and get it back to looking factory because it erases the the patina, the, the, the history embodied in all those little imperfections in both the panel work and also the paint work. So to us, this is a beautiful Land Rover. We, you know, I wouldn't personally touch anything on the, on the, no, on the, no, the body work. And, uh, and yeah, the, lucky, the lucky owner of this gym uh, feels the same way. Good. So, and so is it a family piece or has it been around? In the, has he had it long or it's bought second uh, hand? Or? I think he's had it for quite a while. Whether it's a family heirloom or not, I'm not sure. On, right. uh, on this particular case, I love um, this. Yeah, I just you're just asking <laughs> what you know. What did this? You know. Well, it, and it's been beaten out as well. It, it, <laughs> somebody probably backed into a tree on the farm yeah. back in the day. That's wonderful. Um, like you say, it all so, tells a story, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. So, so this is yeah, this is in for a pretty major overhaul, and this one too. So this is a 1954 Series One. So here we have a Series One, and. Uh, this is a Series 3, so there's the missing one in between is a Series 2. Uh -huh. And this one's come in for a major engine overhaul and also a major gearbox overall. Um, it's had some uh, reconditioned springs fitted, suspension uh, been gone over. Uh, but this arrived to us in really lovely condition on the outside. That's been tastefully repainted by the owner. Um, it hasn't been overdone. It's still got a a bit of a farm look to it, but this has been really so what had, had some TLC. So what did the Series 1 run between? What? So the Series 1 was 1948 uh -huh. to 1958. 58, was it? Right. And then okay. the Series 2 had a short run from 1958 to 1960, 58, 59, 60. And then we have the Series 2A. 2A yeah. And the 2A and the 2 look very similar. Uh, it takes a bit of a practice eye to see the minor differences. But the Series 1, between the Series 1 and the Series 2, there was a major body redesign. Sure. And so this is the, uh, the earlier incarnation of the Series. And uh, more boxy, uh, smaller engine. This one uh, has a 2-litre petrol engine. But the is it very... just the Series 1 that had the in round light? No, the, the, the lights two. in the grill carried through to Series 2 true, and yeah. then the last few years of Series 2A the lights moved to the mudguards. Uh, I believe because in countries such as Australia and Canada it was actually a legal requirement to have the, the wider lights yeah. so you'd actually see the separation. Right, um, right. And that carried over to the Series 3. Yeah. So. Yeah. New panels at all anywhere on this one? Do you think? Are no, they, I don't are think. They pretty straight on the fen on the wings, fenders. As, as far as I know, these are original panels. Uh, this is this is uh, you can see. There's a little bit of. If I run my hand over that, there's some waviness. Right. A little bit of that Land Rover waviness it actually came out of the factory, imperfect. Every Land Rover panel is slightly different. Yeah. So when when you go to uh, let's say you get a replacement door you might find that that door doesn't quite fit because the tolerances were, back in the day, were uh, rather generous. Yeah. So everyone is a little bit like a bespoke Meccano piece. Sure. Um, and what year, what year would this one be? This, 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 I think, is 1954. 54. And wow. pretty original, too. It's... Yeah. Uh, would this have been uh, assembled over here or, or delivered from Britain? This would have been assembled here. Yeah. Most of them were. Uh, they are called CKD or Complete Knockdown. Uh -huh. So they arrived in kit form and then they were assembled at the Press Metal Corporation in Sydney. They were, were then distributed all over the country and some parts were locally made, but most parts were imported direct from the factory in Solihull. I pres presumably sort of tax purposes or something, they had to have some sort of local input that would they have done a CKD um, I don't cards, know or? about that I think it was more that it may have just been cheaper to get things like uh, wheel rings made by local manufacturers right I don't right, I don't think there was any costs, local yeah. contents back then uh, right, back right. then this is, we were just part of the Empire the yeah. British Empire and uh, we, we you know we got got whatever came from the UK yeah um, Anything, uh, any modifications on this one that's been done down the years? Well, that it, well this is this has had a, a soft top I, I don't know if that's original. That looks to me like this, that the soft top might, might be new and, yeah, and uh, added in. And that's a popular modification. Yeah. Um, soft tops have a long history with Land Rover, but they didn't always come uh, 
uh, from the dealer with, with soft tops. Most, most of them actually came as hard tops. Right, yeah. But one of the lovely things about Land Rovers is that convertibility. You can turn a hard top into a soft top. Um, you can even take over here. So you can remove the, the whole hard top here and you can remove the door tops. So it's just two, two bolts, two bolts, two nuts. And the door top lifts out if it isn't rusted in and you can basically drive around with that with just the windscreen up. And then if you really want, you can fold the windscreen forward and get the full breeze. So if we open this door here, and we come around and you'll see there's just two, there's a nut and a bolt here, a nut and a bolt here, and this door top is joined there, it lifts out, you take the door tops off and you've got a convertible. So fantastic for uh, if you want a sort of a, a winter vehicle and then you can turn it into a summer vehicle. With the driving capabilities, with the uh, handling or anything like that have changed between the two or is it pretty much... Uh, the same through to, to the end of the series um, cars? Look, there were modest improvements to passenger comfort and to drivability and handling. And certainly if you get into, in, in an early series one and then you get into a late series three, there's, there's, there's refinements. But even the late series three is, is still very true to its origins. It's a fundamentally utilitarian vehicle very popular with the military, uh, with farmers. Uh, it was a sort of a no-nonsense, get you where you need to go in any conditions. And the comforts are minimal. And anybody driving a modern car would find the handling, um, the brakes, the steering, rather loose, shall we say. Um, having said that, there were important incremental improvements. So, for example, the gearbox went from non-synchro uh, first and second gear, which means you have to double clutch and try and match the revs um, of the, the engine um, to what the wheels are doing in order to not crunch the gears. With the introduction of Series 3 in 1971, uh, we moved to an all-synchro gearbox, like all modern manual gearboxes. Um, so, but the, the old gearbox has its advantages. It's a bit tougher in certain respects. So there's always trade-offs, and uh, but the Land Rover ethos of Practicality, uh, simplicity to repair um, by the side of the road or on the farm. Uh, so if we open up, well, we can't really see here very well because the engine's been taken out, but the engine just sits here. And on either side of the engine, uh, a child could easily stand in that engine bay or a small person could stand in an engine bay and work on the engine with the engine in there. Show me a modern car where you can do that. Yeah, it's sure. crammed full of electronic fuel injection and power steering and all these other mod cons that we take for granted. But this is motoring at its most basic. And I think that's what appeals to people now. People harking back to maybe the simplicity of a bygone era and some of the sexiness, the appeal of these cars is in their profound, rugged simplicity. Sure. And, and this series one epitomizes that. I mean, look at the tread on those tires, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Yeah, they just look like something off a Tonka toy, don't they, really? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Good for the farm, noisy on the road. Yeah. Um, nice. And, you know, some farmer would have added this bar because these mud guards, or wings or fenders, depending on where you come from, these mud guards have a habit of sort of rattling around. Uh -huh. So they, this is a common mod on the Series 1s to right. just put in this little thing here. Here in Australia, or would that be worldwide? People would be doing. That? I'm only familiar with the Australian ones, yeah. but I imagine they would have done this everywhere because this rattling used to drive people nuts. Yeah. And if you're looking at it okay. and you want it to present well, well, if this thing's sort of like this, yeah. off centre. I can imagine. Yeah, certainly on the rutted roads out back and whatever. It's, oh, that would drive you crazy! It, absolutely, they, they're, they're noisy enough. Yeah. In fact, if you drive one of the electric vehicles, uh, such as the ones made by Jaunt here in Melbourne, the conversions, the, the, the electric converted series, uh, for a, a gearbox rebuilder such as myself, um, it's quite ominous because it's very quiet without the engine. All you can hear is the whine of the, the gearbox and the transfer case. Yeah. You think, oh, something's terribly wrong, but yeah. no, it's just being usually masked by that, uh, that uh, rattle of the engine. Yeah. Okay. And maybe we should point out too, um, Something special about Land Rovers and why there's more of them around 
than say the old Land Cruisers, their great rival, is that the panels are aluminium. Because after the war there was a surplus of aluminium in Britain and not much steel. Steel was rationed. And with all the leftover aluminium from manufacturing fighter aircraft, uh, at the time the Rover Car Company, uh, at the inception of the Land Rovers, they were able to get aluminium quite easily. And these turned out to be lighter and more durable and so had an enduring advantage over the steel ones which just rusted out. Sure. So here we have an aluminium bonnet with a steel framework. Yeah. The steel is prone to rotting out, but that aluminium sure. lasts a very long time. Yeah. Well, that's it for this time from Series Magic, but make sure you hit that subscribe button and notification bell because the next episode from here, we'll be seeing Dave do the final assembly on that two and a quarter diesel and attempting to fire it up for the first time in the world. In the meantime, there's plenty more to watch on the channel, so if old British cars are your thing, why not take a look at the Derby Works playlist, where utility is taken to another level.